Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a bi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to talk about a part of the fashion industry known as fast fashion. Fast fashion is the term used to describe clothing designs that move quickly from the catwalk to stores to meet new and quick trends. It's cheap, mainstream, and made to simply meet the demand of staying in fashion and keeping up with the latest fads. Now, while I have no issue with people wearing what they want and being as trendy as they please, the fashion industry is unfortunately riddled with many, many issues. And I do take issue with how these clothes are manufactured. From how this affects the environment to companies underpaying their employees to just poor quality items in general, there's plenty to get into with today's episode. We're going to talk about quite a few companies to accomplish this with a heavy emphasis on the cheapest and fastest companies that are most notorious for their unethical practices. So let's dive right into it. To start, let's touch on the history of fast fashion itself. What is it, why does it exist, and who's buying it? Well, according to one source, many of the retailers that we know today as fast fashion big players like Zara or H&M started as smaller shops in Europe around the 1950s. Technically, H&M is the oldest of the fast fashion giants having opened in Sweden in 1947, expanding to London in 1976, and long before reaching the States in the year 2000. They are then followed by Zara, which opened its first store in Northern Spain in 1975. It's when Zara landed in New York at the beginning of the 1990s that people first heard the term fast fashion. It was coined by the New York Times to describe Zara's mission to only take 15 days for a garment to go from the design stage to being sold in stores. Other big names in fast fashion today include Uniqlo, Gap, Primark, and Topshop. But while these brands were once seen as radically cheap disruptors, there are now even cheaper and faster alternatives like Misguided, Forever 21, Zaffle, Boohoo, and Fashion Nova. Fashion Nova, now that's one brand in particular you're going to hear a lot about today. The thing is, before textile machines and many of the factories built in the Industrial Revolution, fast fashion didn't exist because it really couldn't exist. Many relied on raising sheep to get wool to spin yarn and weave cloth. Fabric restrictions during World War II increased standardized production for clothing, leading to many middle-class consumers becoming more receptive to the idea of mass-produced clothing once the war ended. H&M, Zara, Wet Seal, Express, and American Eagle were all massive trend-driven names in malls. But even they've been unable to churn out clothing trends as fast as we've come to expect. As one source explains, fast fashion brands recently received a high profile cosign as leading ladies Kate Middleton and Michelle Obama have been spotted in dresses from retailers like Zara and H&M. The embrace of disposable fashion by such prominent women would have been unheard of just a few decades ago, but speaks to the democratization of fashion enabled by mass production, allowing more people to communicate through clothing regardless of their social and economic backgrounds. I absolutely love using clothing as a way to express myself. And I think that's pretty normal and plenty of people do that too. Whether you prefer yoga pants and hoodies, sundresses, suits, or jeans and a t-shirt, there's something out there for you. Fashion has gradually become more diverse and inclusive over the years, even if the industry still has a long way to go. So more to choose from, more fashion, more unique styles, and at more affordable prices hardly sounds like a bad thing, right? As one source puts it, fast fashion brands create about 52 micro seasons per year. They overflow their inventory, have extremely broad target markets, and are able to offer low prices due to lack of quality and sheer number of products they sell. The benefits of fast fashion are clear, more consumer spending, more profits, and the consumer satisfaction of being able to participate in a trend almost immediately after they see it in magazines or on their favorite celebrities. However, fast fashion creates a host of issues that make it more problematic than is beneficial. Fast fashion is infamous for the plethora of companies that rely on low wage labor that involves poor working conditions for the people making clothing garments. For example, gender-based violence, sexual abuse, harassment, and forced overtime are all reported in Gap supply chain stores throughout Asia. 
Furthermore, fast fashion is detrimental to the environment. This industry contributes to climate change, pesticide pollution, and enormous amounts of waste. To be perfectly honest, I know I've heard other YouTubers talk about this before. Bernadette Banner is a perfect example of this. She makes a lot of her own clothing, talks about wearability and longevity in clothing, and occasionally mentions why the fast fashion industry is so dangerous as well. Ready to Glare has called out Fashion Nova specifically for their unethical business practices. I've sort of always known in the back of my mind that the fast fashion industry has had issues, and I've recently heard of the brand Pact, a very eco-friendly clothing store based in Colorado of all places that's known for their fair trade organic cotton. And yet, even though they only have a $1 symbol on the good trade as suggested by alternatives to fast fashion, signaling that they're one of the cheapest on the list, three camisoles still cost $50 on their website. And you can easily find plain white camisoles at a fraction of the cost just about anywhere else. I know that buying fast fashion or even just plain inexpensive clothes, honestly, might be so much easier. And I'm guilty of this too, I really am. It's just easier to some degree to just purchase the cheaper clothes. It's easier on your wallet. It's easier on your closet. It's just, it feels like it's just easier on everything. And it feels like it turns into this vicious cycle that you almost can't break out of. But to be clear, if it's something you can afford, I'd say consider it. And well, we're obviously going to get into why. And let's just take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor, Daily Harvest. Sometimes I just don't have the energy to cook. I just need something quick and on the go. And a lot of times that does mean something unhealthy. From taking care of Casper to recording videos, planning out business meetings and everything, I am just on the go all the time from sunrise to sunset and everywhere in between all hours of the night. And it really sucks when the only quick available options are something like fast food, which just is not good and honestly, this shit makes me sick all the time. And that changed when I found Daily Harvest. Now, you guys know Daily Harvest. They deliver delicious food built on organic fruits and vegetables right to your door. And they take literally minutes to prepare. And I don't have to think twice if the food I'm eating is good for me. And they have smoothies for breakfast, which are amazing, flatbreads for lunch or dinner, or maybe like some harvest bowls or soups. And they don't use any preservatives, added sugar, or artificial anything. So if you wanna get started today, make sure to go to Daily dailyharvest.com and enter promo code casket to get $25 off your first box. Again, that's promo code casket for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. So the employee mistreatment is probably one of the biggest complaints I've seen about the fast fashion world, aside from their environmental impact. And Fashion Nova is unfortunately quite guilty of this. I'm not going to claim every single fast fashion brand underpays or mistreats their workers because I can't possibly investigate all of them, but it happens enough within this industry to be a pattern. One New York Times article goes into some incredible death in their 2019 article on Fashion Nova. Los Angeles is filled with factories that pay workers off the books and as little as possible, battling overseas competitors that can pay even less. Many of the people behind the sewing machines are undocumented and unlikely to challenge their bosses. It has all the advantages of a sweatshop system, said David Wheel, who led the United States Labor Department's wage and hour division from 2014 to 2017. Every year, the department investigates allegations of wage violations at sewing contractors in Los Angeles, showing up unannounced to review payroll data, interview employees, and question the owners. In investigations conducted from 2016 through this year, the department discovered Fashion Nova clothing being made in dozens of factories that owed $3.8 million in back wages to hundreds of workers, according to internal federal documents that summarize the findings and were reviewed by the New York Times. Those factories, which are hired by middlemen to produce garments for fashion brands, paid their sewers as low as $2.77 an hour, according to a person familiar with the investigation. Federal officials have to meet with the company representatives about the matter, and as of 2018, the founder of Fashion Nova said that 80% of the brand's clothes were made in the US. Now, their supply chain have shifted, and the brand says less than half of their clothes are made in LA. Whether this is because of the crackdowns from the government forcing them to move overseas or the cheaper cost of labor from overseas sweatshops, well, I guess that's up to you to decide. One sewer, Miss Cortez, said she sewed Fashion Nova clothes for months at a dusty factory in Vernon, California. She claimed to earn $270 a week on average or less than $5 an hour. 
She earned four cents to sew on a sleeve, five cents for each side hem, and eight cents for a neckline seam. She also says there were cockroaches and rats at the factory. It's not as if Fashion Nova can't afford to do better for their workers. They donated $1,000 an hour for over 40 days to those affected by COVID back in April, 2020. This totaled more than $1 million, and that is a fantastic cause, absolutely. But I also kind of find that insulting that they're donating money to people while their own workers are not getting paid and most certainly struggling. It's like they made the donation to look good, not because they truly care about the day-to-day of their own company. They've worked with Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, Christina Milian, Tiana Taylor, and many other influencers. I will say that according to this New York Times article, the clothes that were in the Fashion Nova Cardi B collection weren't found to be in factories where workers were paid less than minimum wage, but I can't say that for all of them. Even though I'm not personally a big fan of Cardi B, her clothes weren't made with ridiculously low pay in this scenario. So as far as we know, that's kind of a good thing, right? It is a little disheartening because this article just lists a ton of influencers that partner with Fashion Nova regularly. It mentions everyone from Nicki Minaj and Kylie Jenner to smaller influencers like Katie Hayne working with and posting about this brand. And she still has a massive following with over 20,000 people. So I'm just saying the brand has spread far and hosts people at all levels. And just for some transparency here, I probably should mention that I have purchased from Fashion Nova a lot in the past. And going through and creating this episode was particularly difficult because I'm one of the people that do purchase from these companies. And I know I'm not alone, obviously, by looking at their revenue statements, but it just kind of sucks sometimes to learn these kinds of things when it's a brand that you liked or a product you enjoyed. And now it's something that I have to kind of look twice at and go, well, this really sucks. Now I have to consider a little bit more when I'm going to decide if I'm giving Fashion Nova my money or not because of the working conditions that I discovered. Fashion Nova has had some other controversies as well. Their clothing line for children looks like it's an adult line. That's a little creepy to say the least. Uh, They've been accused of sexualizing kids because, you know, why does a girl need to be wearing a short mini dress or heels? It, it's weird. These kids look as if they've raided their parents' closet. Some of the outfits I don't really care about, but like, you know, a child wearing mesh dresses and things of that nature, that kind of rubs me the wrong way. Overall though, their treatment of employees is probably one of the most well-known and seemingly shrugged off or ignored factors about this brand. Not only is the behavior unfair to the workers trying to make a living and survive, but the lengths that these companies go to in order to pay as little as possible. According to the New York Times, when Teresa Garcia started working at Sugar Sky, it was called Zella Fashion. It was 2014 and Zella Fashion state records show was owned by Demetria Sache, a woman whom Miss Garcia was told to call Angelina. Several months later, Miss Garcia does not remember how many, the name on her checks had changed, though she had worked in the same grungy factory in the heart of downtown, a few blocks from Soul Cycle. Now her employer was called Nena Fashion, a company that was founded by Leslie Sache, a relative of Miss Garcia's boss, according to business records filed with California's Secretary of State. About a year after that, the name changed again to GYA Fashion. In 2017, the factory moved to an industrial stretch of Olympic Boulevard in East Los Angeles and began using a new name, Sugar Sky. About a year later, Miss Sache stopped running the day-to-day operations and handed the job over to Eric Alfredo Agitas Puac, whom workers knew as her boyfriend. Miss Garcia said she believed the point of all the name changes was to avoid being shut down by federal or state officials. Several workers, including Miss Garcia, have filed claims against Zella, Nena, Gia, and Sugar Sky for back wages with California's Labor Commissioner, the state agency that handles such disputes. In her claim, which is active, Miss Garcia included checks showing she earned as little as $225 for 65 hours of work in a week, the equivalent of $3.46 an hour. She remembers the factories receiving orders from Fashion Nova for up to 5,000 pieces of clothing at a time. Now, this was as of late 2019, and I haven't really seen any updates, so the claims might still be active. But the fact that these companies change their name to avoid being found doesn't surprise me much. Their profit margins are massive. I understand a company has to make money to keep the lights on, and I'm not trying to dispute that. But when someone is paid just over $2 for a shirt that sells for 18, something's not right there. Not to mention with wages this low, how are employees supposed to afford well-made clothes for themselves? Brands will say their products are made in America to appear ethically made, but the garment factories in LA can still be equated to sweatshops. Just because a minimum wage exists here doesn't mean it's always followed. 
It's completely unjustifiable and inexcusable, these wages. It's not as if Fashion Nova doesn't know what they're doing is messed up. The factories are changing their names for a very particular reason. Still, some would argue that overseas, it's actually far, far worse. As AFWA or Asia Floor Wage Alliance, the Center for Alliance of Labor and Human Rights, the Global Labor Justice, Sendane Labor Resource Center and SLD have all reported sexual assault is a massive problem overseas, especially with the brand Gap. Now, I'm not saying that this has or hasn't happened with other brands, but they are the example for today. An executive summary of these organizations' findings had multiple different accounts from women in supplier factories. In May, 2017, one 25 year old woman, Nympia, was told that if she went out with the manager, she'd get a promotion. She refused repeated requests for the dates and human resources didn't act. Women that did date the manager, such as her coworker, Appa, received special treatment. This isn't a great look, sure, but this is only a surface look. According to the report, gender-based violence is a massive problem in these factories where women make up most of the workforce, but rarely have managerial roles. As page 26 of the report reads, women workers reported being targets of explicitly gendered violence, including verbal abuse linked to gender and sexuality, sexual harassment, and threats of retaliation for refusing sexual advances. Women workers also, however, reported being targets of violence because they are less likely to seek redress for violence than male coworkers. For instance, although the industrial discipline practice of throwing bundles of clothes and papers at workers is common, women workers reported submitting to this abuse for fear of retaliation. However, a male worker at a Gap supplier factory in Sukabumi, West Java, Indonesia, described a different response from male workers who face this type of abuse. Quote, I saw a supervisor throw a bundle of clothes at a worker. He threw the materials back at the supervisor, end quote. By contrast, a male worker from a Gap supplier factory in Biagama, Gampara district in Sri Lanka explained that women face ongoing harassment because they are unlikely to report these violations. Quote, girls are harassed by male workers in the factory. I have seen supervisors and mechanics pull their hair, hit their buttocks and touch their shoulders. Most of the women don't react. I think this is why men take advantage of them, end quote. Gender is not the only factor that informs whether or not women report or resist violence. As described in this section, women workers who are members of trade unions or worker collectives both had a strong understanding of their right stand and were more likely to resist violence. Women aren't offered protection, unions, or the rights that many men are afforded in these countries. Though laws and the constitution in places like Bangladesh say women are equal, the workplace doesn't always enforce this. So unfortunately, the sexual harassment documented in this study doesn't come as a massive surprise. There's been physical violence. One worker from a Gap factory in Cambodia stated, there is violence in the factory. Chinese managers beat workers during working hours. Bundles of clothes that weigh between two to four kilograms, the weight of a brick have been reportedly hurled at female workers. And in 2017 alone, the Cambodian National Social Security Fund identified 1,603 cases of fainting across 22 factories, including gap suppliers from the physical toll of labor. 1,599 or 98% of these cases were women. On August 4th, 2017, one 25 year old woman, Mies Shreelik, died when she fainted at work, hitting her head on the sewing table. Her family received $1,000 from the factory, as if that's the value of a life. There's verbal abuse, pregnant women being fired, deplorable conditions. I think you kind of get the picture here. However, this is how adult employees are treated. What about kids? Are they working in these conditions? clearly states on their website that they don't tolerate child labor and Ramwi says they treat all their employees like family while providing industry leading working conditions. Yet though Sheehan says they would never hire underage children, some sources say there's an extreme lack of transparency in their supply chains. One source states on the social responsibility page of their website, they address the topic of child labor. We strictly abide by child labor laws in each of the countries that we operate in. Neither we nor any of our partners are allowed to hire underage children. Any partners or vendors found to have violated these laws are terminated immediately and reported to the authorities. The statement disregards the fact that child labor laws vary significantly from country to country. In Bangladesh, for example, where many fast fashion factories are located, their amended child labor laws allow children as young as 14 to work. 
Despite that, 17.5% of male Bangladeshi children age seven to 14 work. According to a report published by UNICEF in June, it is predicted that COVID-19 will push more children into joining the workforce due to economic strains on their households. It's a little iffy here because in the US, a child is anyone under the age of 18. So when we hear we don't allow anyone underage to work, that might provide some relief. But underage has different meanings in different places. I know there's a lot to be said about child labor, how in some countries it's a harsh necessity. So some families just have enough money to get by. However, for those of us that don't want to support companies that allow child labor, it's worth knowing what the underage rules are in these places that Sheehan operates. The Guardian writes that according to the International Labor Organization, about 170 million children are engaged in child labor with many making textiles and garments to satisfy the demand on consumers in Europe, the US and beyond. The very first words under their why does it exist portion of this article state that fast fashion has endangered a race to the bottom, pushing companies to find ever cheaper sources of labor. Sophie Ova, global campaign coordinator of Stop Child Labor says, there are many girls in countries like India and Bangladesh who are willing to work for very low prices and are easily brought into these industries under false promises of earning decent wages. A recent report by the Center for Research on Multinational Corporations and the India Committee of the Netherlands revealed that recruiters in Southern India convinced parents in impoverished rural areas to send their daughters to spinning mills with promises of a well-paid job, comfortable accommodation, three nutritious meals a day, and opportunities for training and schooling, as well as a lump sum payment at the end of three years. Their field research shows that in reality, they are working under appalling conditions that amount to modern day slavery and the worst forms of child labor. Whether it's child labor or poor conditions under minimum wage given to adults, fast fashion benefits from people in vulnerable states. There's absolutely no denying that. And as long as we keep buying fast fashion and supporting these companies with our dollars, then what reason do they have to stop? Employers get away with this so often because the fashion supply chain is incredibly complex. Controlling every aspect of production is difficult. So employing children without big brands finding out is definitely possible. To top it all off, this happens all over the world. Children work at all stages of the supply chain in the fashion industry. From the production of cotton seeds in Benin, harvesting in Uzbekistan, yarn spinning in India, right through the different phases of putting garments together in factories across Bangladesh. To put it in perspective, 170 million children is about 11% of the global population of children. So about one in every 10 kids across the world is engaged in child labor, according to the International Labor Organization. No wonder it's so easy to rely on child labor as a fast fashion brand. It's simply everywhere. Hell, even if fast fashion doesn't intend to have child labor in their supply chain, it can end up happening because work gets subcontracted to other factories that a buyer may not be aware of. Ova states, companies that sell their products in Europe and the US have no clue where their textiles come from. Maybe they know their first supplier and there are codes of conduct in place, but further down the chain in the lower tiers, it is very difficult to understand where the cotton comes from. And though there's petitions to end the alleged child labor from Romwe, Zaful, and Shein, all of these fast fashion brands, they're still massively popular. According to e-commerce, Romwe ranked 271 globally and made about $370 million. Zaful ranked similarly at 297 and made over $340 million. Shein made over 2 billion with a rank of 48, though proving that fast fashion really does sell. I mean, shit, those are some massive numbers. It makes me wonder what kind of investigation means are in place and if there's any way to change them. Like, could a brand say, hey, we don't wanna work with you if you're going to contract this work to someone else or you know, require that they know exactly where the cotton or fabrics come from and inspect those areas? Because right now the vicious cycle of poverty in these areas doesn't seem to have any escape. If parents can't get an education, they'll end up in low paid work. Their children will be forced to work, miss out on an education and also end up in the exact same cycle and it will just repeat itself. There are some foundations out there trying to break this cycle, but there's others that have good intentions, but obviously struggle. According to my source, the Fair Wear Foundation has a list of over 120 brands that have signed up to its code of labor practices, which do not allow the use of child labor. Accredited brands must ensure with regular audits that all of the suppliers in the cut make trim stage of production meet these standards, meaning it goes beyond most companies in-house policies. 
Other accreditation schemes exist, such as Fair Trade Label Organization and the Global Organic Textile Standard and the Ethical Trading Initiative. But all of them struggle with the lack of transparency in the textile and garment supply chain. But that's what gets me the most, nonprofits or organizations that act as if they're helping, but they can't even do anything. And I'm not saying they're bad or anything or that they have bad intentions. I'm sure they really do want to help, but this issue is so complex that it, there's only so much we can really do as of right now. However, this does bring another aspect of fast fashion into play because it hits a similar note and that's the recycling and environmental impact. Fast fashion brands have certainly claimed to be greener to appeal to consumers, but are they really? According to one source, as an increasing number of consumers call out the true cost of the fashion industry and especially fast fashion, we've seen a growing number of retailers introduce sustainable and ethical fashion initiatives such as in-store recycling schemes. These schemes allow customers to drop off unwanted items in bins in the brand's store but it's been highlighted that only 0.1% of all clothing collected by charities and take back programs is recycled into new textile fiber. The real issue with fast fashion is the speed at which it's produced, putting a large pressure on people and the environment. Recycling and small eco or vegan clothing ranges when they are not only from greenwashing are not enough to counter the throwaway culture, the waste, the strain on natural resources, or the myriad of other issues created by fast fashion. The whole system needs to be changed. So 0.1%. Now, unless my absolutely horrible not meant for math brain is wrong here, that's one out of every 1,000th article of clothing, right? One that 1% would be one out of 100. So I, I think I got that right. How the fuck is that green? Like, sorry if I'm being so brash on this, but I guess the argument could be made that it's better than nothing, but it sure doesn't seem like it's going green in the slightest. I think more consumers have become aware of how harmful fast fashion is. So they're leaving it behind. And this is like fast fashion's way of trying to be more progressive, but this just is not it. I'd say this is just another form of greenwashing of trying to sound more environmentally friendly than you actually are. And in truth, fast fashion is very far from being green. The absolute waste involved in the fast fashion industry is mind blowing to me. According to the Wall Street Journal, Every day, millions of people buy clothes with nary a thought about the consequences. American shoppers snap up about five times more clothing now than they did in 1980. In 2018, that averaged 68 garments a year, the online firm Rent the Runway told The New Yorker. As a whole, the world's citizens acquire more than 80 billion apparel items annually. And on average, average, each piece will be worn seven times before getting tossed, according to a 2015 study by the British charity Barnados. In China, it's just three times, says the Chinese fashion rental platform, Y Closet. I know there's t-shirts I've probably worn a thousand times because I love them so much and I can think of them in my closet right now, but this just, you know, this may or may not specifically apply to you. You know, maybe you're like me, I hoard clothes from like, I literally still have clothes from high school, like something's wrong with me probably. But if you have clothes from high school and however long high school was for you, cause I realize I'm old when I say that, oh, this hurts to admit. The point is the rule may or may not apply to you. I know it's hard to imagine how many clothes are wasted and how to even quantify 80 billion clothes. It's weird to think that like you would buy a shirt and like wear it straight for a week essentially and then throw it away. That's weird. But apparently that's not uncommon and essentially, you know, sure it's spread out between different laundry loads and seasons and things like that, but seven times and then you throw it out. That's, damn, that sucks. Now that of course is the average. Other studies say that the average American throws away 70 pounds of clothing every single year or 191 t-shirts, while only 15% of used clothing is recycled or donated. Other statistics say that number is 81 pounds. Rather than focus on staying in fashion, having a few durable items that seem maybe more cost-effective, but you know, better for you, the planet, and maybe just having a classic capsule wardrobe or something, this is kind of what's happened to us. Earth.org states that fashion production comprises 10% of total global carbon emissions as well. The Qantas International 2018 report found that the three main drivers of the industry's global pollution impacts are dyeing and finishing, yarn preparation, and fiber production. The report also established that fiber production has the largest impact on freshwater withdrawal, water diverted or withdrawn from surface water or groundwater sources, and ecosystem quality due to cotton cultivation. 
While the dyeing and finishing, yarn preparation and fiber production stages have the highest impacts on resource depletion due to the energy intensive processes based on fossil fuel energy. It can take 2000 gallons of water to produce a single pair of jeans and the water left over from the dyeing process is often dumped into ditches, streams, and rivers. And brands, especially fast fashion brands that use synthetic fibers are doing an especially significant amount of damage because those materials take hundreds of years to degrade. And it's not as if we need fast fashion to survive because the products aren't absolute must have staples. This past year proves this because thanks to the pandemic, actually, the fast fashion industry profits were absolutely in the garbage. With that said, I'm really curious what things will look like when the pandemic is over. Will people rethink fast fashion and invest in more durable, sustainable clothing? We can't say, we don't know. I'm not too optimistic personally, and I'm sure that these brands will still thrive among influencers as they have for years. But the demand for sustainable products is growing and clothing should absolutely be on that end, especially the brands that favor profit margins and trends over ethical treatment of workers and our own planet. According to another source that studies the environmental impact of fashion, textiles alongside aluminum generate the most greenhouse gases per unit of material, not to mention the pesticide pollution contributed to the industry too. This source says, the textile industry uses over 15,000 different chemicals during the manufacturing process, beginning during fiber production. Estimates suggest that in terms of financial value, 6% of global pesticide production is applied to cotton crops, including 16% of insecticide use, 4% of herbicides, growth regulators, dissectants, and defoliants, and 1% of fungicides. Heavy use of agrochemicals can cause nausea, diarrhea, Cancers and respiratory diseases and acute pesticide poisoning is responsible for nearly 1000 deaths a day and afflicts neurological and reproductive problems such as infertility, miscarriage and birth defects. In the environment, agrochemicals leach into the soil where they cause a disease in soil biodiversity and fertility, interrupt biological processes and destroy microorganisms, plants and insects. I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't put any pesticides on cotton or that all pesticides are these horrible, dangerous things, but the massive use of these chemicals, the biodiversity loss, all of it could at least be reduced if these cycles we discussed earlier were broken and the trend towards longer lasting fashion instead of cheap shit continued. One McKinsey study takes a hard look at this industry and states that in 2021, they believe the pandemic will accelerate industry trends and shopping will continue shifting to digital channels. And this actually may be a good thing. Fast fashion seems to be, at least to a certain extent, going out of fashion. Fashion executives may hope for a speedy recovery after record low profits, but the industry is shifting. In the report, The State of Fashion from McKinney and Company, they detail a possible outlook for 2021 fashion and how the sales as a whole are anticipated to slowly rise again. There will naturally be a demand for more digital products, but what about more sustainable ones? Page 45 of this report states, fashion's impact on the environment has been in the crosshairs of public perception for some years, as environmental activism increased in prominence and brands started to become more transparent about their practices. Now, social justice and human rights issues are gaining a higher share of voice in the conversation about the fashion industry's pressing need to improve its sustainability credentials. While it is yet to be seen whether consumer attitudes will translate into tangible changes in purchasing behavior, it is certain that the pandemic has amplified public awareness of social injustice in the supply chain. Indeed, as factories closed in early 2020, orders were canceled and payments were deferred or renegotiated. The plight of the 40 to 60 million global garment workers impacted by the crisis became even more visible to consumers. Suppliers across the world were reported to have lost over $16 billion in revenues between April and June, 2020. In May, labor rights activist Kalpona Actor painted a stark picture of the plight of garment workers. Everyone in the supply chain needs to understand that all of the cancellations and not getting money is put on the workers' shoulders, said the founder and executive director of the Bangladesh Center for Worker Solidarity in an interview for the Business of Fashion podcast. Why is it always us that has to suffer even in this pandemic? There are signs that the fashion buying public is taking action to demand better treatment of workers in the value chain. Thousands of consumers worldwide have participated in the hashtag pay up campaign, which calls out brands that have not committed to pay for in production or completed orders during the COVID-19 crisis, which consequently put millions of vulnerable workers at risk. As public concern and campaigns grow, a growing number of brands have started to look at more fundamental changes in their purchasing practices. 
At least some awareness for difficult topics have come out of this tragedy, and it's not just manufacturing. On page 48, the study states that the longer term trend of citizen activism will continue, boosted by social media and a widening gap between the rich and poor, exacerbated by the pandemic. Gen Z, which will account for more than 40% of global consumers in 2020, will lead the charge as the most politically active age group on social platforms. In the US, research shows that Gen Zers are most likely to encourage actions online in the textile industry. People are absolutely becoming more and more aware of the problem at hand. I'm not saying consumers are holding companies accountable more often, but at least it's beginning. 66% of consumers said they would stop or significantly reduce shopping at a brand if they found out it was not treating its employees fairly. Hell, I'd love to see a higher number, but that is the majority and it's only hopeful to get higher as the years go on. And this is something that I actually witness in the comment section of my videos. When I release a video on Lululemon or Lime Crime or Dolls Kill, there's a lot of you in the comment section that will mention, oh, I knew this was a bad company or I'm not shopping there anymore. Consumers are becoming more aware. Even though fast fashion may have grown on Instagram and become gigantic thanks to social media, why can't social media end that growth too? If we demand transparency and sustainability and support the brands that are genuine and give it to us, well, hopefully we'll be putting our money where our mouth is. Again, I know this simply isn't financially possible for everyone. Cheap clothes have their place in the market, especially for those that cannot afford anything else. And that's unfortunately a horrific byproduct of the economy that we just generally live in right now. If buying sustainable clothing is something you can afford to do, then it may be worth considering. As the British designer Vivian Westwood says, and good on you quotes, buy less, choose well, make it last. There's more and more eco-conscious brands out there, so show them some support if you can and rethink the cheap, cute fashion that we wear an average of a week before tossing it out to a landfill. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's corporate casket. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure that you like it, you're following, subscribed, whatever it is so that you never miss a new episode. I upload every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So again, thank you for making it to another corporate casket. Love you, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.